Hello everyone, it's me, Andrew. I'm here in my home in lovely Ligonier, Pennsylvania. Hopefully you all are doing well out there. Um, see, I have, let's see. Well, it says that I have an error. So one of the groups I'm not able to show in. I'm going to have to go through and see about that. But anyway, so hopefully you all are doing well and you're having a good start to your week. It's pretty warm here. It's pretty muggy. Um, one of our neighbors had a rose plant um, that she was giving away. And so she had to get rid of it um, ASAP. So I ran over and dug it up and brought it back. So I'm super hot. Um, but, and I wanted to get ready, but oh wow. Um, I see Michelle's watching. Hi, Michelle. If you're watching, say hello and maybe say where you're from. It's always nice to connect people um, and see, you know, where folks are from tuning in from it's super cool to see so, um the other day we had somebody from watching in south africa and at the same time somebody was watching in scotland it's pretty wild to think that our little little tiny bead shop in a town of 1500 people are reaching people around the world on the other side of the planet it's pretty wild i think Bess is watching. Hi, Bess. Um, so yeah, it's been super busy here. Um, I've been applying to a lot of different things. So I apply to different shows that I want to be in. I apply for residencies and different grants. And um, I got a couple of rejections, which wasn't my favorite. But you know, it is what it is. Um, I kind of feel like it's a numbers game where you kind of have to constantly put yourself out there. And um, like when I was younger, I hardly ever put myself out there. So whenever I put myself out there and I didn't get it, I'd be like super devastated because I was like, oh, oh, nobody wants me. I, I'm terrible, whatever. And then now I just, if I don't get it, oh, well. And then I also make a point to reach out to whoever is doing the jurying or or the uh, grant reviews and thank them for their time and their their efforts. And I know that it's not because I've sat on a grant review committees. I know it's not always easy to make a decision and come to consensus sometimes. So. Um, you know, and sometimes you have to split hairs to get um, the decisions that, you know, make the final call. Um, anyway, so I always make a point to reach out to them and thank them for their time and um, let them know that if they need anything, I'm available. So anyway, so there are some good things that have been kind of turning up Uh I am not allowed to say just yet, but um, I'm super excited. And so hopefully you all are doing well. Um, one of the things that I'm working on today is after I get done with my live, I'm going to finish up a, um, a grant or a proposal to be in a show in Pittsburgh. So fingers crossed. Um, like I said, you never know. Sometimes you think you're you're in it to win it, and then some, you know, sometimes it doesn't work out. So um, I have to do that before midnight tonight. So I've got a little bit of um, a little bit of time. Uh, Norma's watching. Hi, Norma. Michelle says, just here in California, nothing exotic. California is pretty cool. That's it's still on the other side of the country. Um, I always enjoy my trips out there when I go. Harry's watching. Hi, Harry. He's in Des Moines, Iowa. Um, yeah, so um, I'm getting ready for that. One of the things that I'm doing is, or did for that show 
is I finished up one of my self-portrait pieces. And before I get into the tutorial, I'll show you what I made. All right. So what else? So today's Tuesday. Hopefully you all got a chance to head on over to YouTube at some point and check out Jen's uh, Saturday morning tutorial, really cool ring tutorial. Um, if you like those, make sure you like and share those and help boost the signal on them so that we can keep doing them. Um, and um, if you didn't see William, he um, just kind of showed a sneak peek of the project that Annie's working on. It's a felting project um, of a little bumblebee. If you're interested in uh, taking that class, um, we're doing that locally first. And if it goes well, and if Annie is interested, we might do it online. Um, but be sure to sign up for the newsletter because that is one of the places that is that you'll get a lot of information right away. The other thing I wanted to mention is that the buy one, get one half off sale is for kits in the online store. That's www.allegorygallery.com is still live. Um, our goal is to phase out um, the kits, the current kits and um, whatever doesn't sell, I'm going to be breaking back up into individual components and some are going to move over to the physical store. Um, so you, you, I highly encourage you to take advantage of this sale while it's going on um, so that you can get those. Um, they're already reasonably priced, but with the um, getting half off of one of the kits is even uh, more of an incentive um, of getting those. And uh, somebody messaged me about the timeline sale that I'm going to do on my personal timeline. Um, and I was gathering stuff last night. I think what I'm going to do is... Um, I'm gonna go through some of the lots from the videos that we've done a while ago. Cause sometimes when we do these videos, um, people don't really watch them, like the older ones. So like the tutorials, people will kind of replay more often, but like the selling uh, events that we do um, from like a couple months ago, people aren't watching those. So. Um, it's safe to say, like, it's safe for me to kind of um, take those things and uh, sell them uh, or try to sell them. Um, if you didn't know, our car tire, it got punctured on our way to hang out with our friend Brandon the other night. And so we put this sealant in it and um, patched it up and got the plug or whatever. I didn't actually do it. I kind of just like... At one point I was holding my finger over the hole so uh, the air wouldn't escape, which was super fun standing in the middle of the road doing that. But everybody was super nice. So like um, in our in our area, sometimes Moxlam gets kind of a bad rap. Um, they're like, oh, it's, it's kind of uh, a scary place sometimes. But you know what? There were so many nice people and they came out and they were checking on me and made sure that I was okay. And um, our our tenant in the building, in the Johnstown building, he came down and he actually helped us and showed William how to plug the hole um, and patch it. So that was super nice. Everybody was super, super nice and very kind. So anyways, we uh, got that patched up and it was fine. And then we went to the cottage, I think last night, I think last night. And um, I came home real quick to feed the cats and do all that jazz and pick up the extension cord and pick up the pearls and drop this off and pick this up and water this and put that. And anyway, so I got ready to hop into the minivan and the tire was completely flat. So what I think happened is um, it was pretty low and the low tire light came on. So we went to the local gas station and pumped it up. 
And I think we may have pumped it up too much. And in that, it was still, I don't know. But anyways, we, we need to get tires. We needed to get tires before this. But this is like extra making us aware that we need to uh, get new tires. Uh, William patched it up so that we can drive it down to the uh, tire place. So we don't have to get it towed there. Uh, which is nice because it's not as expensive to do that. However, now I have to come up with like $1,200. I wasn't really expecting to do that. So I'm going to have a timeline sale um, and we're going to move some money around, try to get it so that when we drive the minivan, it's safe. And um, knock on wood or fake wood, whatever I'm knocking on. But um, thankfully, uh, it happened like the times that things have happened with the, the tires, we've been relatively lucky and not lucky in the sense that they got messed up in the first place, but lucky in the sense that it could have been like way worse. Cause at one point, uh, when I first started driving, I was on the side of a mountain and freezing rain and the car broke down and it was like three o'clock in the morning. And it was a nightmare, like trying to triangulate, getting help. And the cell service was spotty. And that was a mess. So thankfully, with this, these car issues, the tire issues, uh, it's not been too, too bad. Knock on wood. It's been like we've been uh, like the one day we were right in front of the this the other building. So if I had to go to the bathroom or, you know, do anything like that. You could just pop in. And then also it wasn't like on a busy highway. And it was also during daylight and things like the auto parts store was still open. And so that was good. And then with this issue that just happened yesterday, um, luckily it was in our driveway at home and we had another car. So thankfully uh, we could do that and it wasn't too much of a headache. Um, you know, it wasn't ideal, but it could have been way worse. So thankfully everything worked out, I guess. And we're going to keep trying to get things moving for that. So anyways, uh, yeah. So I keep another, I see some more people tuning in. She says, got to keep on trucking. Teresa is watching. Hi, Teresa. Um, so yeah, uh, so that we've been kind of dealing with that in the background. Um, and so that's, you know, a little bit not awesome. Michelle says, how are the little kitties? They're good. They're super rambunctious and we were playing super hard last night. Poor little Tallulah. She's such a, a fluffy, um, little hairy baby, um, that she gets so hot so fast when when they're playing um and they i mean then when they play they play hard i was like I, who how they have this energy but the, like sometimes you talk about oh wouldn't it be cool if we adopted a kid um but i'm i wake up tired and i don't know these kittens wore me out i can't imagine having to take care of a human child on top of everything um so anyways uh they're good they're super fun we've been enjoying our time with them i've been trying to spend as much time with them as possible so that they don't get you know kind of weird you know sometimes when you don't interact with the cats uh especially when they're little they get kind of kind of um i don't want to say feral i mean if they're outside and stuff then they get feral but, like, if you don't, like, handle them and stuff, then they get kind of, like, they don't want to be in a how like, interact with humans or whatever. So, anyways. <sighs> I need to, uh, all right. So, I'm going to flip this around, and then we'll get to it. All right. So, you're going to see the ceiling for a second or two. I felt like I was like cracking my neck or something. 
This stand is a little bit wonka doodle. Um, one day will be fancier. Maybe. All right. So this is the piece that I wor I'm working on for this show. I did a sneak peek of this the other day. It's kind of heavy duty, but I like it. So this is what it looks like all shined up. It has a Maya Angelou quote. You know, I don't know if people are like really into quotes in like the, the more, uh, you know, the fancier like gallery shows or whatever, but I figure I, I made it so I can do what I want with it. So um, if it says, if one has courage, nothing can dim the light which shines from within. And so this is all sterling silver and fine silver. And then I embedded the different pearls into an epoxy sculpt. sculpt. And so this is the necklace. So I hemmed and hawed about how I was going to do this. So originally, I made those little beaded beads that I showed the other day. I took the, all those apart because I wanted to make sure that I had enough pearls that all match. So the ones, the samples that I showed you all and show, I did a reel on my Instagram. Um, I ended up taking all of those apart to salvage all the pearls. And then um, I made a couple and I used silver spacers in between. Of course, I didn't bring them, but it looks basically like what I showed you all how to do the other day, um, except instead of just the thread in between, then it was silver. So they look like this, but pearls, and then there's little um, silver beads in between. But anyway, so I did those, um, and I was going to have like a bunch of these like pearl balls all the way around. Um, but then I did it and I, I didn't like it. So I spent all that time doing, doing it. And um, I don't know, it just didn't look right. I think also one of the things that kind of threw it off is that they, whenever they were on either side of this pendant, because this is a very large pendant, it looked like I had pom-poms on my head. So I decided that I would go and I took these two different kinds of pearls. They're, well, actually they're the same kinds of pearls, but they're drilled um, differently. So there's ones that are drilled um, at the top here and they're drilled this way. And then there's ones that are drilled this way. Um, like, you can see it. One is on the side, and then uh, one goes through the top like this, and then one goes through the side like that. So I alternated between them, like so, so that it would have a nice, like, fringy effect. And it's really kind of opulent. At first, I didn't know how it would turn out because this one is great big honka doodle do and is pretty heavy duty. And sometimes when you have a really heavy piece like that, it can cause neck fatigue. And not that anybody is going to be like, oh, I'm going to definitely 100% wear this, this necklace. Um, but I... Um, I didn't uh, want it to be like not designed well. So what I ended up doing is I wore it to see if it would cause neck fatigue. And I wore it for a couple hours and it was fine. So, I mean, it pulled a little bit, but it wasn't uh, super uncomfortable. So I always test things out like that. If I have a question about if something's going to be too heavy or not, um, I just, you know, string it up or whatever and test it out and see. And if it is, I can always take it apart and redo it. But um, 
sometimes if you put something out in the world and you haven't tested it, then, um, it, you know, it's not always awesome. So anyways, that's why I did last night. Um, why I finished this up and hopefully I'll get that out in, uh, and maybe it'll be in a museum show. We'll see. Fingers crossed y'all. Um, all right. So let's do the project. So you may have seen that earlier, uh, that have this toilet paper roll and you may be asking yourself what the heck is he going to do with that toilet paper roll? Well, let me show you. Um, so let's make an amulet bag. How about it? Now, this, some people don't like the idea of amulet bags. Um, they're like, well, that's witchcraft and or that's cultural appropriation. And uh, let me just tell you, bags are you know little mat little bags of things are all over there's no um there's no um kind of proprietary kind of claim on that on little bags with little stuff in it so um there's a whole bunch of them whether they're amulets necessary an amulet is a is just defined as being a charm to prevent uh, bad ill intentions basically and so in my mind that's not necessarily a bad thing so if you want to put a little if you're you know if you're catholic for example you, and you wanted to have a little amulet back why couldn't you put a little Virgin Mary in it or um, put a little, little crucifix in there or whatever? Um, so what you put into it is up to you. I'm just going to show you how to put it together. Um, I'm going to use some size 6 seed beads. And the reason why I'm using the size 6 seed beads um, as opposed to smaller beads, which I think using the smaller beads you get a nicer look uh, but also the other thing about that is not only do you get a little bit of a nicer kind of kind of uh more more lush kind of look is that um if you put anything that could be uh that could like come out uh, a smaller the smaller beads create a tighter mesh of beadwork and prevents those things from from coming out so for example if you put uh, uh some sage in it or something like that a little sage sprig um it's less likely that it's going to get out if it is used with the smaller beads so you kind of will have to play around with this to get the sizes right and of course, if you need to, you can always adjust these uh, these uh, measurements and different things like that for your own project. So if you wanted a bigger bag, you could always do a bigger bag. If you wanted a smaller bag, you could do a smaller bag. If you want to do it with different size beads, you can always do it with different size beads. So it's really up to you in your project and what you want to do. And I'm also only going to show one color. And this would have been way better. This would have been super better if I showed you with at least two colors or more to show you pattern building. But it's, patterns are kind of a pain in the butt. So I don't know how well I'm going to... I'm not going to dive too deeply into that because... Um, you know, that's a, it's a more fiddly thing and it will take a little bit longer instead of just showing you the technique. So I'm going to show you with size six seed beads, um, but I like it when it's size, um, size eight or smaller. So usually around 11. Um, I will also say that if you have Delica beads or cylindrical beads like that, um, then they work way better. And I'm not just saying that because I have some, I don't have a deal with them. It's not sponsored by them or whatever. 
but they just snap together a little bit better. Now, sometimes there is a wonky bead in the mix and you kind of have to sort through. And if you see a bead and it's like obviously larger or smaller than the other beads, just pick it out. I mean, that's like a half of a quarter of a, of a cent for the bead. Um, you know, sometimes when you have like a, a finite amount of beads, you want to use every single bead. But if you use the ones that are, are noticeably larger or noticeably smaller in that kind of construction, it will kind of mess up your pattern and things won't want to fit as smoothly and there'll be some buckling and things like that. So just keep that in mind. If you see anything, any of the beads, sometimes they get even the ones that are graded, what they call it grading, when they kind of sort through. Um, so even if you, they're graded, and they there still might be the chance of some being smaller or larger. So just keep that in mind. You can just pick them off and use them for fringe work or something that doesn't require them to lock together really well. Um, I'm just going to use some check glass or check seed beads. Check seed beads are not necessarily um, the easiest to work with because they are not all uniformly the same size and same shape. So some may be a little bit rounder, some smaller, some larger, but it does work. So don't think that you can't do it if you don't have the delicas because delicas are, are nice because they everything kind of snaps in place and it's very satisfying it's almost like you're like you know uh, playing a game um but if you don't have them you can still make this project and it's not going to be the end of the world all right so well, you do need, I like to use, a t the way that I was taught to do this, I was taught by um, a lot of the seed beading stuff by an artist named Dottie Westerfeld. Um, and she taught me how to do different beading in the round on uh, a toilet paper roll. And the reason why we're using this is because the toilet paper roll has a tension in it. It's like a... It has a memory of being this shape. So you'll see what I'm talking about in just a second. Let me get a needle because I don't see the needle that I was working with the other night. Um, and we won't be able to do anything if I don't have a needle. So that's very important. So, I don't know. Um, I was looking around and it's like the needles get raptured in the night. So I found this short. Usually I like to use a um, size 10 or 12 long needle. It's their beading needles. They're flexible-ish. Um, and if you can get the ones, the old ones from England, those are really nice. But I don't, I think that they don't break as much. Someone was telling me that they like to use tulip needles. Um, because there's less breakage of needles. So I don't know. It's up to you and what you prefer. I'm going to be using the spiral line because I have it 
It's a smoke colored, it's an eight pound. So it's relatively versatile. And I'm gonna cut a wingspan, which is an arm and a torso length off. And I'm gonna thread my needle. Now, I prefer to use a beading needle, but since we don't have it, that's what we got. You know, you dance with the date that you got. Um, and we'll see how well it works. It should be fine because we're using the size six seed beads in this. But if I was using a smaller, if I was using smaller beads, I would 100%, 100% um, go and hunt for the right size needle. And the reason why is that these shorts are not as flexible, number one. Number two is that um, they, they're they thicker, they're thicker needles. So um, you, if you have like a size 11 seed bead, this isn't going to fit through. Um, it might like barely scrape by, but if you're doing multiple thread passes, um, you're not going to be successful. So because we're using these great big honkin' size 6 seed beads, um, we'll have, we should have plenty of, um, uh, room in them. All right. So the next thing we're going to do is we've got our tube and we've got our scissors. You have to get the, not the, the child scissors that don't cut anything and you don't want to use your good fabric scissors. Um, so, and then you're just going to cut... straight down your tube, all right? The next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of determine how big of an amulet bag I wanna make. I'm not gonna make a great big one because I wanna do this in real time and that may be, you know, it's not easy to bead that fast if I do a great big one. So I'm not going to make a huge one today, but you'll get the flavor of it. All right. So I'm just going to pick up. If you want, if you're worried um, about um, the beads coming loose um, while you're stringing, you can always put a stop bead. I generally, if I can avoid adding a stop bead, I, I tend to avoid it. And the reason why is because then after I do everything else and I have to pick it off. Um, and sometimes if you have, if your tension's pretty tight and stuff, it's not always that easy. So I like to, if I can get away with it, I'm not going to do it. So I'm not going to do it. But if you are like new to seed beating or you're nervous or whatever, um, then you can more than you're more than welcome to add a stop bead if you want. All right. So I'm going to add one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, if I had my long needle, one of the other benefits of having a longer needle is that you can kind of uh, test things out. So if you want your, your amulet bag to be this wide, then you know that you need to have two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight. You need eight plus eight is 16. So you would need 16 if you want it to be that wide. I would like it to be a little bit wider. So I'm going to add eight more and then I'll see how big that is. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And this is going to be even count. And the amulet bag is going to be this wide. And so that's pretty good size. So two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. So I'm gonna add 16 more beads. 
One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, and sixteen. So there you go, thirty-two. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk this a little bit down to get closer to the end, not all the way to the end, y'all, because I want to have enough to weave it back through at the end. So I want to give myself maybe four or five inches at the end. And then when I get that, I'm going to loosely tie a knot. All right. And I want to make sure that that's going to fit. I know from previously doing these that this will fit. So if I know that this is going to fit in there, then uh, I can uh, tie it up. So I'm going to make another knot, overhand knot, and then add another just to be secure. And pull that pretty tight. Now, the reason why I've got this paper towel or this toilet paper roll is cardboard paper towel, toilet paper roll, is that I need it for tension. So what I'm going to do is I rolled it up. See how it, I cut it? I'm going to roll it up. And I'm going to insert this into my loop. All right. And I'm going to put it in the middle. You may be like, why is he putting it in the middle? Well, if I put this in the middle, it's not, I can always move this down. I can slide it down. But if I put it to the end, what can happen is if I put it towards the end too soon, what can happen is it'll make like a cone, like a funnel. And that's not necessarily what I want to do. All right, and this is pretty tight, you know, it's, it's, it's holding the tension pretty good. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to find my needle, make sure that there's no tangles, and get that out of the way. I'm going to pick up a bead. And... You see how the thread's coming out here? I'm gonna skip this one and go into this bead and out through it. This is also why a flexible needle is, is better because you can do these tricksy moves like that and it just slides right in. All right, and what I do sometimes is I'll take a piece of tape, like painter's tape, and I'll I'll tape that tail down sometimes if I want that to be out of the way. So the goal is when we put this in here is for these two beads to sit next to each other like so. If it's off to the side like this, no good. You have to kind of gently encourage it to be um, sitting side by side. Um, if you have Delica, it's way easier because these row cowls, um, they're vintage row cowls, they are a little bit rounded so that they are not, you know, it's like this. It's two, two rounds kind of hitting where if they're, they're, if it's Delica's are flatter on the side, so they'll lock together like this. But with those ones, they're round or so there's a little bit of space. So they do kind of wander around, but after you get a couple rows in, it's no problem. All right, so I picked up a bead. The thread's coming out here. So I'm gonna skip this bead and go into the next one. Now, one thing that I'm gonna be trying to be mindful of 
is that my beads that I'm adding are all on the same side. It's not 100% essential, but it does, like, you don't have to mess around with it later. Later, you're going to end up having to do some, some things where you have to, um, like, move stuff around. So I like it to be all on one side if possible. All right, so I picked up a bead. Thread's coming out here, so I'm going to skip this bead and go into the next. And I'm just going to repeat this until I go all the way around. Now, even count is a little bit easier to do, but if you want to have a, a pattern, some patterns require you to do an odd count. Um, and uh, yeah, those are, um, you have to do a, what's called a step up. And I'm not going to talk about it because it can confuse you if that's not what you're doing. But this is basically even count peyote stitch, what we're doing right now. And you can do this on a smaller scale and make little cylinder beads, little tubes. Um, I They don't necessarily make good, like if you're gonna do a whole necklace of it, cause it kind of wants to stay as a tube. Um, so if you do decide to do that, um, do it in segments, and then you can kind of link those segments together. And it's not as um, you uh, you it, you'll have more flexibility and bend in your piece, because um, otherwise, it's basically a ruler then, or some a straw. I don't know, a seed beaded straw. All right, so I'm just gonna continue around this. I'm gonna go around. Sometimes the, the thread will get caught up on this on this tube. So you wanna be mindful about that and not, um, if it does get tangled up, take care of it earlier than like pulling it super tight and then having to try to reverse engineer how to get all these knots and stuff out. It's always easier when you can, um, you know, take care of things. Like if you can do it right the first time, that's the best. Um, if you can't get it done the first time, then the next thing to do is um, do it before it gets too bad, that's better. And then um, if you can correct it, that's good. And then if it's not, if you can't correct it, then that's bad. So don't wait too long. Don't pull too tight and like be in a rush. Because if you're in a rush sometimes, then it's easy to get kind of like distracted. And then you just like, um, you know, then you don't uh, do a good job. Hi, Amanda. Um, she's tuning in. Um, so... Another thing that I wanted to talk about while I'm doing this, and hopefully I'll be able to multitask, is um, if you haven't had a chance to head over to the Touchstone Center for Crafts YouTube channel, please give them a like or a subscribe because um, they're growing their um, YouTube channel. And it would be nice if they could secure that name. Um, and you have to have so many people subscribe before you can do that. And they just kind of really started. So um, if y'all could run over there at some point um, and give them a like, that would be super great. Um, YouTube is a wonderful resource. It's one of the most growing um, search engines. I know some people think of YouTube and they think of just videos and stuff, but a lot of times people say, well, how do you do this? And then they watch a YouTube video. So it's a really powerful thing. So, um, if you haven't liked, or if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, uh, that would be great too. 
our YouTube channel, if you search for Allegory Gallery, we should come right up. I hear William. Oh, Needles. He is watching. They go, they have, something happens. Like, I don't, I get nervous that the cats are getting them. But um, we would know. Um, he's going to go to his pottery class. No, it's filming tonight. Oh, it's filming tonight. Um, did you feed the kittens? No. I don't know what day it is. I'm like, oh, it's pottery class. It's every night's pottery class. Um, so they're filming tonight at the cottage, which is why I couldn't go and do that this there. Um, you might notice that I'll be at the cottage a little bit more. I hate to do that because I, I like to play with the kittens. Like I take a kitten break and I huggle their necks real good and hard. Um, but that um, the cottage has air conditioning. The um, house we haven't put the, the we you we have um, we don't have central air in our house. So we put. Um, I'm gonna just switch this needle, y'all. He brought me the needles. I'm not gonna look a gift horse in the mouth. I'm just gonna do it. Hallelujah. This is, these are um, the beadsmith ones. Um, if you can find the old ones, those ones last forever. But we sell these. Um, we don't sell these on the website, but if you are interested in anything like that, like needles or thermally bonded thread, whatever, we are a fully stocked bead store, so you can always say, hey, I'm looking for this, and we can see if we can find it. Sometimes we have things right away, um, and then sometimes we have to order stuff in. We're not necessarily a seed beading store, believe it or not. You know, I show a fair good amount of seed beading on these tutorials, but we're actually more of a stringing store. Um... But, you know, I think one of the things about string is I love string um, and what people can do with it. But the, it's not as, like, once you get it, then you kind of, like, you got it. So it's not as, um, I don't know. So anyways, we, uh, um, what I was saying was um, we just, turned on moderation for posts in the design challenge group, the allegory gallery design challenge group, um, you still can post stuff. So I encourage you post away. Um, you know, if it's using products that we sell, then have at it. Um, if it's using ideas that we've showed, have at it. Um, if it's a post that's referring to another business, um, you know, maybe don't post those because, you know, we do, we do believe that the rising tide kind of raises all boats, but at the same time, um, you know, we're, we're trying to make a living and it's kind of like going to somebody's birthday party. And then, like, going over there and then trying to get other people to go to a different party. I got kittens. They, they have a kitten break. Two. Okay. I had to go bring them downstairs. What? All right. Close that door up and show the kitten on the screen so they can show see the baby. Okay, mm -hmm. there's the back of the baby's head. You want to see the back of the other baby's head? Gertie alert. alert. That's her little tag phrase. She has only been here not even this tonight makes two weeks. They already have tag phrases. Alert. She already has artwork of her. You're gonna, you're gonna hide from me around there. She's a sweet one. Look concerned. Well, you like that kitten break? 
Boy, I need to fix your pocket. No wonder why you're worried about losing stuff. His pocket, that something went in there and it then wore a hole in the pocket. Oh. Also, sometimes when you have other bees, especially vintage seed bees, you have to check to make sure that the holes are clear, free and clear. Because um, sometimes um, the bees will break and um, they the little parts of it can get stuck in um, in the in the recesses so um just make sure you you can always spend more time later um with like a, a little awl or something and you can pop them out amanda says how's gilbert doing he's doing pretty good um he we we realized also that um so after Babette died he became a little bit more territorial and so um we started putting these uh it's like a pheromone or something in these diffusers and it makes the cats chill out and so um we realized that those had gone empty they said that they lasted like a month but i don't know about that um and I was like, maybe it's like a different kind of month, maybe like February. Um, but anyway, so it so we realized that he was out of the the pheromones, and so we put we ordered some more, and um, and he is he seems to be in a better mood, um, but. Uh, yeah, he, he, it took him a while. Gilbert or Barnaby, he, he's fine. He is, he gets a little bit nervous when they surround him and they like want to kiss his face a lot. But, um, otherwise he's been pretty chill about it. Gilbert, he's a little bit grumbly about stuff. So, um, Yeah. Teresa says, I already subscribed to Touchstone. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that means a lot to me. I'm, I sit, uh, and just so y'all know, full transparency, I sit on the board. I was recently elected again for the board of directors for Touchstone Center for Crafts in Farmington, Pennsylvania. So, and I sit on the communications committee. So that's one of the reasons why you'll hear me talk about stuff like that more and more. All right. So when you get all the way around, that's the hardest part, y'all, is to get started. The next part, okay, is easy breezy. Y'all, you're not going to even, we're going to go warp speed, y'all. This is, and his famous last words, right? No, uh, but we'll, we're going to kick up the gear here and uh, get cracking. So when I get to the end here and I finish adding them, I will go up through this top bead here. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up a seed bead and then I'm going to go into the next seed bead. And then I'm going to pick up a seed bead. Go into the next available seed bead. It's like if, like, it's like if somebody had some gaps in their tooth and their teeth, and you're going to fill the gaps in. So you, wherever there's a gap, the next gap, you get the next, gets the next bead. Now, if you're developing a pattern, you can always grid the pattern out. So. Um, you know, the old school ways, you take some graph paper and you like divide it up and then you color in whatever your thing is and then you can plan it out. There's computer programs that do it. I don't really do that kind of stuff, so I could not tell you. I know Michelle, who usually watches, she does that kind of work. So, and more like a tapestry stuff. But for me, I don't really do that. So I don't really use it. I've looked into it. But again, I don't generally do a lot of seed beading because it takes a little bit more time. 
But um, for fast stuff like this, this is easy peasy. Um, Cindy said, liked and shared. Thanks. We always appreciate it. Okay, so I'm just continuing to add um, wherever there's a blank spot. I'm just at right in the next, the next order of operation. I'm going to do that. And you just have to be careful. You know, one of the com most common things that I see is when people try to go too fast too soon. Um, you know, like they get a couple stitches down and then they're like, whatever, whatever. I mean, you just go whole hog on it. And then, um, you know, that's where the mistakes happen. But if you kind of just like ease into it and relax, and it's pretty easy and pretty repetitive. So I get my book on tape or audio book. I'm dating myself, y'all. Um, and um, just relax, you know, and try not to rush it. You know, sometimes it's, you know, you got to get stuff done and do stuff quickly. But it's better to kind of like just have... Um, be a little bit more methodical um, instead of like rushing through and then having to fix problems because that's harder to fix problem. It's easier if you just do, you know, take your time than it is to kind of like rush around and try to fix things. Now, if you do get a knot in your thread while you're working, you can always take it out. Um, but the other thing is, is that with these size six seed beads, it's not going to really matter. With size eight seed beads, it's not necessarily going to matter. With um, size 11 and 10s, 10s, 11s, 15s, that you're going to have to take the knots out. Um, and again, if you take it out sooner rather than later, you're going to have less problems. Um, cause I feel, I can feel on my thread, there's a knot right here. And so what I do is I take the tip of my needle and I work it into the knot, into the middle of the knot. And then sometimes we'll take another needle and just work it open and then see there's a loop there. And then I just pass that and undo it. And you may be like, why is he messing around with that little tiny jubility business? And the reason why is um, if you're working with smaller seed beads, um, if you have a little knot, it will, it, it will be hard, hard, hard to get that in there. All right. So I've come up to the end of this row. So then what I do is I look at this row and then I know that I have to scoop up to the next row. So go through that next one. And then you, you can put it in like so. Um, it's more apparent on some of these, like if you have it more, uh, if the shape is a little bit more, um, you can see it a little bit more on some of these. And that doesn't sound right. But um, uh, when you're filling in, sometimes what happens is they roll, they go, they want to stick together. And so they don't want to have that weird kind of three, two, three, two. Um, or one, one, two, one, two. So it, peyote stitch is your, you've got these like, it's the in-between part. So this two and then three, then two, then three, then two, then three. And so you're constantly kind of building that back up. So that's the thing about that. That's the even count peyote. And sometimes it doesn't look like it should, you're like, huh? And also, because I'm using these round beads, 
it's not going to want to look right. I'm just going to tell you. It gets, as you go further, um, you can see it more. But um, right now, it looks kind of like not, not a lot happening. And it actually kind of looks like you're pulling it apart when you're working on it. But the more you add, the more it kind of fills in and it creates that kind of pattern so that you can um, can put your, your, your beads in. They all kind of just lock into place at that point. But you see what I mean now? Like this is a much looser kind of um, weave using the larger beads. So if you do have anything that's super tiny that you're worried about coming out, you know, use smaller beads and then you'll have um, more success. So this is, um, it goes together pretty quickly, but, um, you know, that's a, a relative term. Um, but you just keep doing it, adding more rows. Um, I kind of wish that I had some other colors and these size sixes here, but I don't really have a ton of beading stuff here at the house. It's all at the cottage now, pretty much. And so you, you can't really see it as easily, but um, you get the point. It's really just basic, even count peyote working in uh, the round. So... If, um, if people are like, what are you doing? We're doing even count peyote stitch. And like I said, it gets a little bit, like it looks a little bit wonky right now. But once it fills in, it'll look way better. And the reason why it looks a little bit wonky is because it's so big. The bees are so big. Um, when it's smaller, you can't really see that all that. It, it's such a small size that you don't really see the where it kind of pulls apart a little bit. Now, one thing you want to make sure not to do is to split threads. If it happens, it happens. But if you can avoid it, definitely avoid it. Because, um, and what I mean by splitting threads is when you're pushing your needle through, and you encounter the resistance of the thread, pull your needle out and kind of wiggle it around so that you're not like splitting the thread. If you split a thread, you might think, oh, that's good because you're reinforcing it with like, it's like being woven together, literally sewn together. The problem is, is that you are weakening that thread. And so if you do that too many times, what's gonna happen is it's going to um, cause a problem for you. All right, so I've reached the end of the row and you can see what I'm gonna do next. I'm gonna go into this bead here and then I just fill in. So I'm just gonna do this around and around, adding more beads. You're gonna, um, if you have, uh, so this is a one, two. Uh, we started watching this show called Andor on Disney Plus. It's one of those Star Wars shows. I have to tell you, the first couple episodes, we we tried to watch it before, and I just turned it off because, um, you know, I like period movies that are not necessarily action-packed they have the dramatic slow looking at somebody crying gently i am not afraid of those movies i watch those all the time um there's not a ton that always happens in those movies but even though i like those movies that was a little bit um of a too too not enough happening i was like what's gonna happen and then my friend Shanette said we had the same experience, and she's like, "This number two business, I can't, I can't even get through this." And then they said that if you get to past episode three, episode three is where things start picking up. And so we got, I, we decided to give it a second chance, and went back and started watching it again. 
and it was actually pretty good. So that's what we did last night while we had dinner. And then after dinner, I worked on my pearl piece and cleaned up some at the cottage, which is a constant thing. I kind of, I, I, I don't know. I have, I just need to spend some quality time in there cleaning because it gets a little bit crazy. And when it gets crazy, it gets crazy fast because uh, we're still kind of settling around where things should go. All right, so I'm just going to do this over and over till I get to the end. Um, and if I was better prepared, I would have done this off camera, and then I would be like, and through the power of TV, um, you know, we'll skip all them steps. But I thought it'd be okay if we just hang out and did this in real time. And of course... I don't know. My numbers are dropping, so people must be getting bored of me talking about Star Wars. I've always were more of a Star Trek person, but anyways. All right, so I reached the end of that row, so I'm going to jump up to this next speed here and see how this is kind of filling in a little bit easier. Once you get that going, it goes a little bit quicker for one. And then it sits, it sits more properly. Um, Michelle says, still here. Oh, good. Are y'all working on anything while you're watching? I know sometimes people like cook dinner or do some, do their own thing. Um, and that's good. Because right now it's just pretty, pretty repetitive. But if you were going to do something where you weren't making a bag or something like that, then um, you could use this as a little ring. You know, you can make seed beaded rings. It's basically the same thing. I'd probably use smaller beads. And... Um, you know, I like to use a thermally bonded thread for this because it gives it a little bit more structure. Um, but um, sometimes Nymo is good if you want your bag to have a nice drape to it. Um, but again, I would probably do this with smaller beads, but it makes it a little bit easier to see it on camera. I mean, you can make these with big beads, but, you know... You just have to be okay with, with that. Um, I mean, this is, I like both Star Trek and Star Wars. Star Trek is a wee bit, a Star Trek a wee bit more. Me too. I, we watched Strange New Worlds the other night, and that was pretty good. Um, I still get corn fused real hard about how, about the Klingons. They had those, they redid the Klingons in Discovery. And um, I liked it, but um, I guess people did not like it. And so they've been trying to like retcon it and like fix their problem. And so anyways, it's interesting to see that. The character design, how that changes. Uh, Michelle says Star Wars 2. Picard was a good one. I like the last season of Picard a lot. Um, the first two, I was not a fan of. I did not like it at all, hardly. I was like, what, what, I, I don't know. I got enough of my own problems. All right, so um, I got to the end of this row. You can see how it's evolving. This little toilet paper roll, if you need to adjust it, you can always roll it in on itself and then let it kind of spring open and that will reinvigorate the tension. 
But what I'm gonna do is I see that I'm coming close to the end of my thread. My needle just fell off, so that's a good sign. I'm going to cut off more of this uh, thermally bonded thread and I'll show you how to add thread. Now, some people like to work with really long pieces. I saw one instruction and they had like, I don't know, like meters of, um, of um, thread. And I was like, how do they not get that tangle? I would get that immediately tangled. All right, so what to add thread, I take two fingers, I take my thread, I hold it in, on my, my thumb and forefinger and middle finger, and I wrap it around it like so. And then I take this, the long side, and go through, and it splits that circle in half, and then pull it through. And then this is what's called a slip knot. And then I take my working thread that I just had my needle on. Usually I keep my needle on so I can keep track of where who's who. I slip that over that working thread and I hold that down while I'm doing this. And sometimes that helps to brace it. And then I pull my um, the short and long parts of that, of what I just added, um, I want to get that nice and close and get that really in there. And then you pull it until you hear a snap. And sometimes it's a little bit fiddly, especially when this is a little bit bigger. And then I take the two short ends and I tie that into a little knot. One overhand knot and then another overhand knot. And then I put this off to the side until I'm ready to deal with it. And then I do it like that because and then I'll work these in and I'll tie these into there and add anchor knots. And then I'll eventually remove, uh, weave those back through. And that will make our piece stronger. But it will also, um, um, it, it will make our piece stronger. And then if there's any kind of weak spots, I can then go in and, um, it, like if you have, sometimes with this kind of stuff, if you pull on a bead, the whole thing will come undone. And that's not good. So m the goal is to distribute the points of connection all, throughout your entire piece so that it's, it's not hanging by a thread. Um, with this piece, by the way, um, I showed this the other day. I saw somebody and I, and uh, and they only had one thread through the through their thread bridges here that make up these sides. That's fine. However, that's a weak spot. So because these beads were so big, I went through the whole entire thing again and went through and reinforced these each one of these things. It sounds like it took a long time, but it was actually pretty fast. Um, and that made this much stronger. So if this gets pulled, it's not going to instantly yank and then all your beads fall all over everything. You know, you have a little, it'll yank it, but it won't be completely over. Um, Norma says, still here while watching. I'm making a birthday necklace for a friend with my blue and green Monique Monique beads and the green girl cat pendant from the kitty kisses kit oh good amanda says that sounds amazing norma i'm making a bracelet and just have realized i have to take some of it apart oh no so i'm gonna fill this back up so i'm not scraping the bottom of the the bowl I can just dip it in. This is William's 
ceramic that he made. Um, the other thing about this, this goes a lot quicker when you're not on camera. And one of the reasons why it goes a little bit quicker when you're not on camera is that you can hold it in a position that you can actually see your work. Um, sometimes when you're on camera and stuff and you have the camera in the, in the way, it becomes harder to see. Um, William, he, um, I don't know if, if he's, if he's still watching or not, but if he's still watching, he should take a picture of the, of the arm that's over the workstation where Jen is filming. Because once we, he was trying to show me how to use it the other day, but I was like, I, I don't know, I got stuff to do. Um, but um, that will be good eventually because then the camera won't necessarily be in my face when I'm trying to do this. So that will be wonderful when that happens. Um, one of the other things that's good about doing the stitches and weaving them back in is that you can re, um, reinforce the structure. So you see how on this row, it's all flat, but these in theory should be together. So these, it shouldn't be a flat round it all the way across. It should be staggered. And it's important that the beads are staggered later on because if they're smooth like this, they're not gonna want to zip together like a um, Velcro. Um, Cause sometimes you need it to do that. You, you need those things to lock together in place. Um, so anyways, No, Mrs. Amanda, that sounds familiar. I just had to restring this because I missed three beads on one side. Oh, no. Yeah, I was restringing last night those little pearl rounds. I don't even know where they are now. I kind of tidied up, but it was super duper late. And then at one point... Um, so because William, because of the tire situation, William has been taking the little car. And so his key for the little car, the little um, loop on it broke. It's just a um, plastic key. Um, that part broke. And so at one point I had run a wire through it, like I drilled a small hole and then ran a wire through it and then put epoxy sculpt and it worked. However, the problem then was that it was in this, when it was on the key ring, it was kind of flexing because he has a lot of keys on that key ring. And so um, that was flexing. And so it was chipping off the epoxy sculpt. And so it didn't really, the fix didn't really last that long. So what I did last night was, or early this morning rather, um, I took his key and the body of the key um, is plastic, so um, malleable. And then um, I went in and I drilled some holes and I formed some copper sheet metal over it. And um, then I did some bald rivets. The one of the rivets got wonky because, so what I was doing is I have this piece of wood. If you do a bald rivet, it's super important that you have it so that it's cradled in the wood. Uh, uh, if you want those, if you want the rounds to be round, you cradle them in the wood. And so when you're hitting the rivet, it embeds in the wood and it doesn't move around. So what ended up happening was I thought it was all good to go. And there was a little hole from something that I had drilled previously and the bald part, um, B-A-L-L-E-D, bald like that, not B-A-L-D. Um, like I'm balling up this 
piece of trash is B A L L I'm making into a ball. But anyway, so I balled up the metal by heating it in the torch and um, it creates a bald head pin. Um, but anyway, so that uh, head pin had kind of went in the hole. And so when I flipped it over to check on it, it was kind of wonky. So all the other rivets are great, but that one is wonky. So, and at that point I was like, I'm too tired. He's got to go soon. And um, so I did not get to fix that. But now it's pretty, pretty sturdy. It's a piece of sheet metal that I have attached, riveted onto the key. So unless he pops the rivets, then it should be good to go. Um, but yeah, so that's one of the projects that I did last night, but yeah. Amanda says that happens to me all the time. I'm guessing about ripping out this stuff and having to redo it. So anyways, um, yeah, so I've just been mostly been working on different um, grant proposals and scholarships and trying to get my summer situated. I have a couple classes coming up this summer. I'm going to be going to Touchstone and doing a workshop um, with Harlan Butt. I believe that's in July. I need to look at my calendar a little bit so I don't get surprised. Um, and then I know I'm going to have one in September with Sharon Massey. I was trying to do one every month uh, this summer, but the one that was for this, it was supposed to be this week, um, ended up not going. And then I ended up trying to do a class um, at the end of the month up in Massachusetts, but I couldn't secure the funding to make that happen. So that was kind of disappointing. But like I said, you never, you know, you can't win them all. So um, I did not do that. And uh, I don't know, you know, I think that it's going to be kind of tricksy to get um, to take any classes with a tire situation. So after this video, I'm going to do my application before it gets too late so I don't wait until the last second because I've been doing that. Um, and I feel like maybe that's part of the reasons why I haven't been getting stuff is because I've been um, getting, been waiting on stuff. But anyways... Sometimes it, I think one of those things is I always like to wait because I think I can do more stuff and I do more stuff, but I don't always document things as I'm making them. So I think it's super important that if you are like applying for grants and stuff and you're applying, like you're building your portfolio, you know, do yourself a service and do yourself a favor and document your work as you go. And, um, you know, put down the year that things were made, the titles of pieces, what they're made of, and just keep that for yourself. Like, I was doing that a little bit on Instagram, and that made doing this, doing some of the, uh, the paperwork that I was doing so much easier instead of trying to triangulate and figure out like, what year was this? Did I make this in between this? When did I make this? Did I make this first? Did I make this thing last? So it's kind of like my um, uh, my CV. Um, before I had the shop, before we had to open the store, you know, we lived in New York City and I was much more active in the arts community there. Um, I shouldn't say that I, I'm less active here, but I was more in it to build my own career at that point um, because the store didn't exist 
out then. So I um, I didn't really do stuff when I, like, I don't know about you, but when we do a project, we kind of throw ourselves into it wholeheartedly. And so um, what that means is that for the first couple years of the store, that's all I did. Um, I worked freelance for some different books and magazines. Remember those? And so I did that in the background. Um, so what I would do is I used to do everything for, for the store. So and William, he would come and help me on the weekends occasionally. But um, he was working his other job. And at that point, his other job was not remote. So he had to be there every day. Um, and so he only had weekends to help me. And I mean, he did paperwork and things like that behind the scenes. But um, so I would be at the store every day and we did the online store, but the online store wasn't what it is now. So I thought about how I had to do the online store, but we would get like a couple of orders. You know, it wasn't like, like it is now where we have um, a person who does just shipping. Um, but anyway, so I would do that. And then in the night, I would make stuff to sell at the store. So I was constantly making earrings and necklaces and things like that to sell. Um, and we used to, I used to do a lot more with like the Chamber of Commerce and different clubs in town. And so that took up a lot of time also. Um, and then when, after I was finished with all that, then I would do my freelance work. And that's what we did for the first, my goal was to do it for the first five years, but we ended up doing it in four years. Um, and then when we hit that mark, William was able to quit his job, his other job, and move to the store full time. And we bought the house at that time. And so we've just, you know, we were doing that for, I kind of st stepped back from being in the store every day. Um, and then, and spend most of my time at home or in the studio making stuff. But I do a lot of like paperwork and like ordering for stuff and for the store and a lot of like kind of just figuring stuff out like grants and things like that and press releases and anyway, so um, yeah. So, anyways, I don't even remember what I was saying. But, uh, oh, that I didn't really, for a long time, I didn't really invest in my, myself. So, like, uh, or my own career. So, I would promote our artists that we were showing. And, you know, one of our artists was like, you know, I worked with really big galleries in the past. And they didn't, didn't do half the stuff that y'all did. Um, so I thought that was a nice kind of thing at one point, but I was kind of neglecting my own CV and building that up. And so um, the problem with that is that if you do, if you neglect having your resume, then um, your resume gets with, with how you call sparse. And so if you looked at my resume, there's a huge, if you look at my resume, there's a huge gap from when I was like in New York and in school and doing stuff. Um, and then when we had the store, like everything was store all the time. Um, now it's everything's about the store, but we have a little bit more flexibility to do other projects um, like the cottage and the Johnstown building and different things like that. So, um, you know, we're growing things little by little. Um, 
So yeah, anyways, I if you can keep on top of your your CV, that's awesome. So what I do as a trick or a tip or trick, maybe I'm going off script, y'all, um, is that I have an email that I have the document going and I email myself and then I just reply and add whatever I just did. So if I got into a magazine, I add that to my resume and then I just send it to myself and then delete that old copy. And the reason why I do this is for two things. If I have just a static document that's sitting on my desktop, um, I'm not going to edit it. I'm, I'll just tell you, I'm not going to do it. Um, because, and then when it comes like a year later, when I need it to apply for something, then I'm all trying to figure out and counting on my fingers and toes what day was what. Um, and when I made this and when I did that and checking dates and looking at that. Um, so I like to keep that kind of document. It's like a living document that I can um, adjust if I need to. And then I just send it to myself and then I have it wherever I am. So it's not tied to like a desktop. Like nowadays with everything was like the Apple ecosystem and stuff, it's not as bad. But I remember like I would be doing stuff on my computer and I'd be like, oh, I need this file, but I can't do it because it's on my computer and I'm at home and I only, I'm, on, I'm on my phone and I can't go and do whatever. So anyways, that's what I do to kind of, as a tip to keep my, my CV up to date. Um, and then also I need to kind of look at it and figure out how to tailor it a little bit more. Because one version, I have like all this stuff. Um, I have all of the, um, oh goodness, I done went away from my brain. I got a notification and I, it kind of derailed my thought process there for a second. Um, Oh, well, so it's talking about something about resumes and stuff. But yeah, it's super helpful if you're doing shows and stuff. Just just add it and keep it, you know, keep it fresh. That way you don't forget. Because my thing is, is we do so much stuff that I forget stuff. But oh, I was talking about how I need to go back and like condense things. So like I was in a lot of books and magazines. So if I listed every single book and magazine I was in, there's over 30 publications, so the list is long, y'all. Um, it's not, there's a lot of stuff on that. So, anyways, that is, I, I kind of have to, like, uh, wrote from this time to this time for this place, because otherwise, if I listed yeah, each and everything, it's going to be, like, a, 10 page document and nobody wants that William so they added some photos of the camera arm on our page in the group and on YouTube community tab oh good um, I would say add it to the patreon since their their patreon money helped pay for that um and if you want to take picture or show pictures of a, of you weed whacking the before and after of that, uh, I'll add the one picture that I took um, because that was a pretty big thing. William was really good, and he did all the weed eating um, in the flower beds. So at some point this week or this weekend or next week on Monday when I don't know when we're going to have time to do it but um well let me go back in time so if you make a mistake um it's super easy to fix you just pull the beads off but the reason why I did that is so that I kind of have a fresh row instead of adding a thread in the middle of the row 
And then I think what I'm going to do is just one more uh, pass until I run out of thread. One more thread work. And then I'm going to add one more thread. And then, um, then I'll show you how to kind of cinch up some of these beads here. And then we can talk about kind of sewing up the seams. And then you'll see how to do that. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I know this one is not probably the most exciting, thrilling tutorial. It's just the same thing over and over. And there's not even a pattern in it. But um, if there is something that you're interested in seeing, let me know and maybe I can make it happen. Um, I can't always do stuff. But if I can do it, I will, I'll, I'll definitely try to accommodate you. I'm on here three days a week now. I'm on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday and doing tutorials and stuff. So um, so I need to, we need to put some on the bottom of your bowl, William, so I don't scratch up the desk. Um, but anyway, so, um, so if there's something you want to see, let me know because I don't, you know, I don't know if there is something in particular that you want to see. Um, I can maybe show you all rivets instead of just describing it and show you how I fix the keys, even though I did a terrible job on that one rivet. Uh, my goal is, and this is not an immediate goal, is, or I guess it is, I don't know, but to go through and hunt down all of my samples. I was thinking about this. So we have a flat file. Okay, so let me go off script since we're, we're basically going to be here for another 10 hours. Um, so... At the cottage, we have a lot of storage, but because I haven't decided officially where things are gonna go, I haven't put a lot of stuff away because if it goes away, if it's like, if it gets put in a box, it doesn't exist to me. Like if, I go, if, if it's in a box somewhere in the cottage and I didn't physically do it, it's like it didn't exist. So um, that's kind of bad. But it's also one of those things where if I do it, I know exactly where it is. I know, like, on what shelf it is. And, um, like, it's so weird. Like, in my, even in the craziness of my, the kind of disheveledness, I know exactly where stuff is. Or pretty much where stuff is. Like, William was like, where's the wrench? And I was like, it's down, it's downstairs in the foyer in front of the thing, in front of the thing on the floor right there. Um, and that's because I put it there. But if it gets been a bar, it's like it doesn't exist. And that's not necessarily great because I ended up buying a bunch of stuff. And then I looked through and I realized I already had it. So that was kind of a not awesome but, you know, it is what it is. And some of those things I'll take over to the new place when it opens. And then that way, um, you know, they can have use it for their studio. And by there, I mean our studio. Because I don't know if I, we told you this or not, but we plan on having a couple benches at um, Butcher Block Gallery so that um, we can have a couple of classes and be, I, we just looked at the space the other night on Saturday or, or Friday. I can't remember what day. Um, and, um, I realized cause originally I was going to put six benches in. I don't think we're going to be able to fit six in. And there's this really cool kind of refrigerated counter that's like the first refrigerated counter. It's old, y'all. It's made of wood and, and I don't know what else, but probably asbestos or something fun like that. Um, 
but anyway, so that's there and, and it's kind of in the middle of the room. And we don't want to move it necessarily because it's kind of cool. It's got the history of the building. And um, I don't know. I think it's super cool. But it is like smack dab in the middle of the room. So um, it does make logistics of like putting benches together problematic. So at least to begin, we're going to start with maybe four benches. And if things grow and we have the need for it, we might try to scale it up and do bigger classes. But four is a good number. Four is a magic number, you know. It's not too many. It's not too few. We can make it go. But anyway, so that is the plan um, for Butcher Block Gallery. We're going to have a little station for people to take some metalsmithing classes. We're going to do a lot of sawing and filing to start. And then eventually, um, if people are interested, I'll do some soldering. Um, we have to get that kind of, that situation kind of set up. Um, and then do some things like that. Um, but our goal is to do small things first. And then once we get kind of a general, you know, we'll offer a couple classes a month. Um, and if people are interested in open studio night, I might be able to swing that if people want to come and work. Um, but if that takes off, then we can do more things. If it doesn't take off, I don't want to invest like a ton of money into like upgrading a whole studio and then, you know, and then nobody shows up. And then we just cry gently into the bankruptcy. Um, but um, yeah, you know, it's one of those things where we're, I, we're gonna take it kind of cautiously um, worst come to worst, we can always, like, there's a back room at the store that we don't rent currently. And in theory, we could put more stuff back there if we wanted to. But it would mean that our rent would go up almost a double. So I don't necessarily want to do that because that's like, at that point, it's like the mortgage for an entire building. So, you know, it's kind of one of those things where we want to do more stuff, but we're kind of limited by what um, our resources are. And we invest everything back into our business. So, it get, I mean, not everything, everything, but like a lot of our the lion's share of what we make is invested back into the things that we're doing. So, um, you know, it's one of those things where uh, it's hard sometimes when you're trying to grow and you don't have the cash flow to make it happen. Um, you know, I would love to be able to like snap my fingers and just do everything overnight. Like, it would be great to be on, like, one of those home improvement shows where you're just like, oh, I want to do this, 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 and this. And then you list it out, and then a team of contractors gets to work, and then they just, like, bust it out, and then it's, like, done. Wouldn't that be awesome and fun? But until that happens, um, you know, we just kind of have to do things as we can do them which is not terrible, but, you know, I would love to be able to do lots of fancy things all the time. All right. So hopefully y'all are not concussed into complete boredom at this part point. Um, I'm just going to add until I run out of thread, and then I'll show you how to close this up. I don't want to do it too early. I mean, if I do it too early, it's not the end of the world. 
Um, but I do, if I've spent this much time on this, I would like to keep this as a sample. And I don't want to just like jump the gun on showing you how to do it because then it'd be like, wow, then it's not really a usable sample piece necessarily. So I don't know. Anyway, so hopefully you all are doing well. I don't know if any of you all have had any small business experience, um, but that's kind of um, a lot of what we do is kind of figuring out how to make things happen. And so there's a lot of components to that um, and they are always changing. So that's the kind of frustrating but exciting part is that like once you think you're good, then everything, the rules of the game kind of change. Like we were doing really well on Instagram and like one of my posts got like 20,000 viewers or um, views on it. And I was like, what? That's like more than this whole area. If everybody turned their thing and watched my thing, that's more than all of that. And um, um, then the next day I got like four people watch my thing. So I think that's one of those things where, you know, you think you've got it, you think you got it, and then boom, not got it. So I think it's good to have peer groups. Um, I'm in this group. Uh, run by Josie Lewis, who's a painter out of the Minneapolis area. And so I haven't been doing her homework recently, and I feel a little bit guilty about that because, like, we're paying for the membership subscription and stuff, and um, I do get results using it. I just have been so busy with everything else that I haven't had a chance to do it. But um, yeah, I need to get back into the swing of doing that because it's really, I think, useful because sometimes it's, like you do stuff so much. Um, like, you know, you do your thing the way you do it and you there are reasons why you do it the way that you do it. And so sometimes it's easy to forget, you know, I don't know. You get, you get kind of in a, in a rut. So I think it's sometimes good when you can get like a fresh perspective or you can kind of feel things out and then, all right. So this is what this is slow and steady wins the race. I'm sure there's people who are much quicker than I am. Like, I look at stuff, like, by Lisa Liu, and she um, has a piece in the Whitney right now where she seed beaded a kitchen. And I'm like, how? And that whole thing is covered in seed beads. And I'm like, I can do, like, in two hours or however long we've been going, I can do, like, how many inches is this? Two inches? Of course, I've been talking the whole time, so, and not necessarily focusing 100%. So there's, like, one eye out for comments and one eye out for this. Um, but I'm still not super fast. And I've told, this is another thing. Like, I've talked about this before. So if you've heard me talk about it before, um, forgive me, but I'm not necessarily a fast person. I'm not like quick about things. And this used to drive some of my former employers crazy. I worked as a barista in New York City all the way through going to college. And when I left and took some time off to help raise Azalea when she was little. Um, when I went back to finish my degree, I still work through them. So anyways, um, when I first started working there, um, I was very kind of methodical about things and I would do things. I would work with urgency, you know, cause you don't want anybody to not get their drinks or whatever. But at the same time, I didn't have that kind of frantic energy that some other people, you know, some people, you know, they look 
like they they have like their their auras are lit up with that extra energy and you can you just feel it and mine is more like quiet kind of mellow you don't know if i'm like tired or what but so at first when i first started working there i they were like you're not fast enough but then what they saw was that because they can tell you know they can keep track of sales and stuff is that i was making bigger sales and that my um i wasn't getting uh um i can't remember there was a specific word for it but basically it's when they when you have to remake something so it's like there's waste involved with that so if you make something and you make it wrong then you know it eats up some of that profit money so i had fewer things and also the staff that i worked with we had developed almost this weird kind of nonverbal language um and um so i could look at a table and the other person who i'd be working with who is like the they call it the dmo but um he would see me glance at the table and then know that he had to clear the table and so um at one point i creeped out the upper management because they look they came for a walk through and there was a woman and she didn't have water and so I looked at the woman and the other person at that point, I was a little bit higher up. I think I was an assistant manager at that point. Um, she saw me look at the woman, got the water out. And it was so weird because normally there's a lot of like screaming and shouting that goes on behind the scenes and uh, at a restaurant. And that is not my favorite. Um, you know, there are people who thrive off of that. Um, I do not thrive off of that. Um, and so, yeah, that was like a nightmare. So I worked with one guy and he would always throw stuff. And one time he threw um, a cutting board and there was a knife on it that I guess he didn't see. Maybe he, saw, he knew it was there, but I don't think he did. But he threw the cutting board and then the knife got embedded in the wall and stuff. And there's like all this screaming and cursing. And like, I don't know, I, I'm not, I don't enjoy that. I don't like to get screamed at. I was like, if I wanted to get screamed at, I would have joined like the army or something. Um, I'm just making drinks. This is not like, you know, this is not, you know, scream worthy kind of uh, environment here. Um, and so I had, I ended up transferring out of that that location because I just couldn't take it. It was like there was nonstop screaming. And the, the crazy thing is is that it was an open air kitchen. So and and it wasn't like completely open. We had like a sneeze guards and stuff, so people couldn't like you know blow their nose and then wipe their hands on the stuff. But um, you know people were watching. It was almost like um you know people can see you and i don't know as a guest i don't like to feel that kind of energy and so yeah all right so on that note of reliving that i'm going to step up into my next row and what i'm gonna do is normally what i would do is before I start sewing anything up, I would go through and weave all of these ends in. So wherever there's a there's a um, an area, you just weave it back through, and then eventually you'll go through and you'll pick up where you can see you can see there's the thread in there. And even if you can't see it, you know there's what's called a thread bridge in between here because you know that that's how the beads are attached in the first place. So you can kind of scoop down like so and pick it up like that. And then you can tie a, a knot in there. And then that will strengthen this up. 
You don't want to do it too, too tight because, again, uh, you do want a little bit of flexibility. You don't want, okay, here's the problem uh, with a lot of techniques like this. Um, there's stuff like crochet, not as easy to show online. There's stuff with like seed beading. It's not as easy to show online because, I mean, you can show the steps, but getting that tension just right is sometimes the trickiest part. Because if it's too loose, it will fall apart and have, it'll be like the beads will kind of be hanging out and like, like dangling like a loose tooth off of that little nerve end in there. Um, and that's not ideal. Or if it's too tight, you won't be able to get your needle in and it will just, you'll A, break a needle or needles, or you won't be able to manipulate it enough that you can get your, your needle underneath a bead or underneath a thread bridge or whatever. So you do kind of have to have it not too tight, not too loose, just right. Um, and that's one of the hardest parts about um, like online tutorials like this for this kind of work because you can't be there to like get the feel of it. So we made this and if we wanted just a um, if we wanted just to have a, um, a tablecloth ring, I don't know what you would do, like tiny cozy, I don't know. Um, and if you wanted to do that, then um, yeah, you're done. But instead, what we're going to do is we're going to fold this over. And you can, um, one thing that you should always be kind of mindful of is, is if something does not want to easily go with the beadwork, meaning if I'm moving stuff around and I try to squeeze it and force it, that's not a good long-term solution. And the reason why is that if you try to do that, your beads will break. Sometimes your thread will break, sometimes the beads will break, but you're putting tension on your pieces where it doesn't need to be. And you can really mess up. Like if we spent almost two hours making just this, and if you spend two hours and then you start trying to squeeze the heck out of it, then, and it breaks, and then your thread gets loose, and then you have to do all this repair work, you know, you're just wasting time. So gentle motions, gently squeeze things into position, and you can always go, and you can always go back over and, um, you know, if something doesn't want to smoothly go, you can always make it go. But just be, be gentle-ish. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back up to the top here and make sure that doesn't get caught. And then, so it becomes almost like a zipper. See how those beads kind of want to fit together? So I'm going to put this through this one. And then I'm going to go to this next bead here and stitch that. I'm going to pull gently, not too, too tight yet. I know I'm going to go in through this one and then this one. And I'm zigzagging across. And you want to make sure you don't catch the other beads as you're doing this. But what you're doing is you're sewing up that seam. And make sure when you're doing it, it doesn't get caught on those beads. And it's not going to want to fit right away. And that's okay. We're just going to gently encourage it um, as we go. It's not gonna make like a super crisp edge and that's all right. Cause we've got those two rows of beads kind of meeting in the middle and they kind of visual, they kind of take up, you know, they're not small. So, you know, they're not gonna necessarily want to, you know, fall flat. And then once we get, we're almost there. And 
I guess we can go through here. And then you're gonna pull this thread. And that's the seam that makes the bottom of our container. Now you would tie this thread up and then that's how you get, you can kind of manipulate it so that it opens up. See how this is kind of a loosey goosey style up here, up at the top here. You can pull your thread and get that. And if it doesn't come, it, if this is too loose to start, because you have to have it, have it have a little bit of play in order for the beads to uh, have enough room to move, but too much play and then it's gappy like that and that's not ideal. But you can pull it tighter. The thing is you don't wanna pull it too tight and get it, uh, and uh, break the thread. So if that happens, you can always undo this seam and then where it's loose here, you can tighten it up. Or if you want, you can go through and tighten it up um, one at a time like this. So you go through and pull those thread bridges up. And you see how much gap there was in between? It's actually a lot. So. Um, you can get that and pull that up until you can comfortably yank it. And then when you can comfortably yank it up, then um, we're not there yet, apparently. Um, but that's a lot of maneuvering to do. But you see what, how, what I mean by um, that you have to leave enough room because if you put it, pull it too tight right away, it's gonna be a problem. But if you do it too loose, it's not gonna fit together like that nice little, nice little zipper action here, um, which is the whole reason why even to do this stitch is because you get that kind of zippery kind of action. And then what I would do is if I know that this is gonna be the bottom, which it is, I can always go through and reinforce all of those stitches um, just to make sure that um, if anything comes loose, I can kind of have it uh, be secure. I don't want, this is where a lot of the uh, tensions going or where a lot of the actions going. Like if you put stuff in there, that's where it's gonna be. So if you know that, you can reinforce that and then there's less likely. So if this is the top, what I'm gonna go do after is I'm gonna add some thread and I'm gonna go through and work my way around and it's gonna look like I'm going in curly cues around this. Um, and it's just to cinch these tighter so that, that there is a little bit of a stagger because right now it looks like this is all one level and then this is all staggered down here. And what I want that to do is I want all that room in between, you can see that line of, of light coming through, is I wanna, I wanna eat up all that light and then it will be kind of that cinched. And then if I wanna use this as a little charm or amulet bag for a little necklace, you know, if I wanted to, I could always add a flap over, of course, or I can um, add a little loop here and a loop here and use that to hang. And then I can put whatever I want in there. So if I want to put my little change purse in there, I can put my little change um, and that's fine, you know. And then if you want it so that you don't, um, uh, if you don't want it to open again, you can always sew this shot. Like there's the there's the, these African pieces that are super cool and they're called amulet necklaces. And a lot of times what they'll do is like write stuff down on like a piece of paper and they'll roll it up and they put it in these little, little pouches and then they seal the pouches and then they add these little pouches onto a necklace. And it's super cool. I love the way that looks. Um, they they feel pretty like magical, um, 
is that's how you make that little basket or this little amulet bag. Um, this did take longer than I thought it would. Um, usually when I upgrade to a size six, it goes pretty quick. So this is one of those projects that does take more time. Um, and the cool thing is, is if this bottom, if you don't like the way this bottom looks, you can always do brick stitch on top of this and then do like a fringy bottom, you know, add some fringe on there. So it looks kind of like that. You can dress it up in a lot of different ways. You can also, one of the things that I do when I make mixes a lot of time is I add vintage sequins to the mixes. Um, some of the new mixes I don't because I want them all to be like all the one kind of gemstone or whatever. But with some of my older mixes that were not specific like that, I would put a lot of vintage sequins. And one of the biggest questions I get is, what do you do with all these vintage sequins? Um, and you can incorporate that into a surface treatment uh, and peyote stitch like this, even count peyote stitch is great for that. So you just come through, add your thread on, pull up your thread through in between these pieces, add a sequin, add a seed bead as a stop, go back through the sequin and then go into the next bead and then repeat or however many long and you can make it, it's almost like a, it almost becomes like armored scale at that point. Um, and you can find sequins that are really beautiful and iridescent and, um, and they can really add something, another dimension to your, your work. So that's how you make that y'all. Uh, hopefully that wasn't too, too painful to watch. I'm going to finish this up off camera. So what that means is anywhere where there's any threads like this, I'm going to weave those back in. And then um, I'm going to also add those, just those beaded loops. And like I said earlier, if you add anything that's structural like that. So if you add anything like... I showed, I did this off camera, but I did an example of spiral stitch, but I did it without the dagger beads. This is with the dagger beads. This is without it. And also without the crystals, it's all just seed beads. But if you have something like this, which is a structural loop, you need to think about that. Because if you put one thread through it and just tie a knot, it's gonna be super, your whole project is going to be reliant on the thickness of this thread. It's going to be, that's what's holding it together. It's dangling by a thread, y'all. So if you do have something that's structural, like this loop, just go through it as many times as you can. Two is okay. Three is best. If you can do more, all the better. Um, when then you have some, when you're working with smaller seed beads, that's not always possible, but if these great big honking ones, they have a much more room. So you can go four five, six, probably times through it. And the more that you do it, if you go through and you tie an anchor knot, stagger where you tie your anchor knot and work your way back up. And then that way, if anything pulls, it's not all pulling from one spot. It's pulling throughout the piece. And then it, for one, it won't distort your piece because sometimes if you pull real hard on one, it's going to, and you have a pattern, it'll throw off the, um, the stagger of the beads and it can look really wonky. But if you have that and it pulls from multiple places throughout your pattern, then it's a more even and stronger point of connection. And also I would recommend if you have anything like this, add a jump ring and connect that to your toggle. Um, make sure you have a nice, ample, thick jump ring that's not like flimsy. If it is flimsy, you can always double up jump rings and use two or three or whatever. And not only does it look like a decorative element, but it also has a little bit more sturdiness. 
But the cool thing about that is that say something happens where you want to change out your toggle or your however your clasping situation is going to be, you don't have to take the entire piece apart to do that. You just have to open and close those couple of jump rings. Also, if something gets caught, um, it will pull on the jump ring before it pulls on this beaded loop. And that will be great because, you know, if you have to replace a jump ring, that takes like five seconds to do. If you have to replace this entire thing, then, you know, two hours, hour and a half, two hours is just, you know, is just time that you're lighting on fire. So use the jump rings as your friends to attach stuff. It's not super hard. You just have to make sure you, if this is your loop that makes up the seed bead, you pivot it like this. You don't want to pry it apart like that because it will change the shape and it will also create a weak spot and you don't want that. So just pivoting it like this. And if it doesn't meet, all you have to do is open it up, squeeze it gently and then overextend it and it should snap back into place. And then you'll have a nice good seams that won't come loose and also the beads aren't going to squeeze through and get through any kind of like tiny cracks in between where the the jump ring ends don't necessarily meet so um that's something to think about for your designing i know some people they're like i don't want to think about that that's like my least favorite part but sometimes it could be cool. It's an opportunity. So there are things that are coming to the market that they didn't really have before. If they had them before, people weren't using them as much. But like, for example, adding jump rings, that could sound kind of boring. But a lot of jump rings now, you can get really cool kind of fancy jump rings um, that have uh, twists in them and beading in them and stuff where they took and took a ball burr and kind of uh, went around and brought up the kind of round shapes on them. So there's a lot of options on how you can incorporate that and use it as an aesthetic thing as, as opposed to just for um, the mechanical parts. Because that's kind of boring. If, you, if all you have to worry about with your work is like the how things are going to fit together and the mechanical parts then it's not as, uh, as exciting at least not for me as being able to to um you know do whatever but anyways i've talked y'all ear off and we're over the two hour mark i hope you all enjoyed this the, and learning about how to put together a little amulet bag if you do end up making one, I would love to see. Adding uh, patterns in this can be as simple as just adding rows of different colors and you can make stripes. I saw a really cute kind of pride um, rainbow one and it made me wanna do one like that. Um, but all the bees are at the cottage. So maybe I'm gonna have William go and, and dig around for me. Um, and see if he can find them for me. But um, yeah, so there's a lot of different options. I hope people have enjoyed these tutorials. Like I said before, if there's anything that you're curious about seeing, please let us know at info at allegorygallery.com and I'll try to accommodate y'all. I think tomorrow, if I don't get any suggestions, I might do some mild fold forming, um, some metal work, maybe. Maybe we'll make some some little pea pods. I don't know. Um, I found these facet while I was cleaning last night, I found these faceted green pearls and they look just like a sweet pea. And I was like, wouldn't it be cool? And I know it's not the most original idea, but I do have a way that it makes it different um, to have that fold form be incorporated in the pea pod. So I don't know, we'll see. Maybe I'll do that tomorrow. Maybe I'll do something else. Um, I will say if you're still watching um, and you're curious about how you can help with like the tire situation, I am going to be posting um, an album on my personal timeline 
and it's going to have a bunch of stuff for sale. And if people want to, of course, get stuff, that's awesome. But I know sometimes it's not always in the budget to do it. Um, and, but there are free ways that you can help. Um, and one of those things is to, you know, like and share. Um, but also, if there are things that like catch your eye, one of those things that's so easy to do is leave a comment and generally comments, uh, four words or more, um, it helps show that people are engaging with your posts. So, you know, instead of saying, it's great, um, and be like, this is really great. I really like this, you know, just add a, you know, a couple of extra words there and um, you can definitely help boost the signal and get the word out about things um, and help. And, you know, you don't even have to, you know, spend any money really. It can take five seconds to do it and you help a small business out. It's so easy. I think sometimes in this world, we think that our, that we're powerless and that we don't have the ability to do certain things or affect great big movements of change. But sometimes the small things add up, you know, just a few seconds here and there can really make a difference, you know, because sometimes somebody else will see it or, or somebody will see that um, a post will get, is getting more traction. And so they, they become more curious about it. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why people do a lot of different things, especially online, but, um, engagement really helps. So, um, I don't want to beat a dead horse as they say, but, you know, liking and sharing really helps and commenting, of course. All right. So on that note, thank you so much for tuning in. I've been having a lot of fun with you all. Um, you know, I haven't, Generally speaking, I only go on one day a week in front of the camera. And, um, you know, sometimes I hang out behind the camera and help William do his lives. But, um, yeah, so it's been kind of fun to get back into this and showing things every day. Um, if there is anything that you want to see, be sure to email us at info at allegorygallery.com. And maybe we'll make it happen. So, anyways, thank you so much. Have a great evening and a great rest of your week. And, um, yeah, see ya.